Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And welcome to all of you who are participating, worshiping online, wherever you are in the world, um, in, in Florida, or maybe you're in Skokie, Illinois, uh, somewhere in downtown Chicago, or maybe you're all the way from Chehalis, Washington, watching, participating with us. Welcome. Happy Sabbath to you. If you would, wherever you are at this time in the chat, YouTube chat or Facebook live stream, if you just put in there where you are worshiping from, we'd love to to see where all of our participants, worshipers are, are coming from, worshiping from. So please do that at this time. As uh, Rosetta earlier had talked about, we are done with our 10 days of prayer, and we are so grateful for the opportunity to come together as a church. We had a number of participants through Zoom, our Zoom link, participating with the 10 days of prayer. We started uh, 10 days ago on a Wednesday, and then we had other participants through our live stream through YouTube. So definitely want to thank our production team behind the scenes, our IT and media team for helping make sure that we were able to, to stream live on YouTube our 10 days of prayer. And for everybody who participated, thank you so much. I know God did a, a mighty blessing in your life, and uh, many of you shared with us how God was blessing in your life and how much how it was really needed in your life. Others said it was timely. It came at a, a very good time in their lives to, to participate with the 10 days of prayer. And so we know that God is doing a mighty work in our membership, and we pray that he continues to do that. And certainly if you want to, if you miss the 10 days of prayer and maybe you want to do it on your own, please contact me. I can give you the notes for each of the 10 days and uh, you can do your own 10 days of prayer and asking for God's spirit to work mightily in your life, seeking revival. Seeking revival was the theme throughout the 10 days of prayer. Several things that have happened throughout the 10 days of prayer is that we decided that we would do another diaper and baby wipe drive. This is to help supply diapers and baby wipes to our sister church in Goshen. Goshen's Goshen Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Chatham neighborhood in South Chicago. We've done this before, I believe, uh, back in June or July, I think, and it was uh, uh, quite the experience and a blessing for the community there. We want to be able to do that again, so uh, look for the announcements through our email newsletter as to when that drive will be, uh, but I think it will be the 20, 20 Fourth on a Sunday from 10 to 2, 10 to 2. You can bring your donations here to the church and we'll receive those donations. One of the other things that seems to have uh, revived our church is our Adventure Club is wanting to do a prayer meeting every week. Isn't that something? Asking our young people to join in Bible study in prayer. So be looking for more announcements as to our Adventure Club wanting to do a prayer meeting every week through Zoom and uh, in conjunction with our regular prayer meeting with the adults. So that is a major blessing there uh, with that. So as a church, what do we do after 10 days of praying together and seeking revival? What do we do? We continue to plead for continued revival. That's what we do. We uh, put out our, our revival, we put our revival into practice, and we also invite others to join in the spiritual revival that we've just experienced. In the coming weeks on Sabbath, our topics will cover things like proclaiming Jesus passionately to a starved world. We'll be talking about prayer and coming together in, in uh, prayer partners, getting prayer partners and praying together. But for today, we explore, after the 10 days of prayer, we explore and celebrate a forgiven and transformed life. How do we follow a 10 days of prayer and seeking revival? We celebrate a forgiven and transformed life. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Luke. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, starting with verse 36. And this is an encounter with Jesus. 
a religious leader, a Pharisee, invited Jesus to his home to eat. And you would think that it would be some kind of social gathering, and in a way it could be, but there is some curiosity, you would think, that the Pharisee has in inviting Jesus to his home. And so we pick it up here, and we're going to read the complete story here. So follow along with me in your Bibles. Luke chapter 7, starting with verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil now when the pharisee who had invited him saw this he spoke to himself saying this man if he were a prophet would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have nothing to say to you. I I have something to say to you, rather. And so he, he said, teacher, say it. Verse 41, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who forgave more the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Verse 44, then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and, and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has no, has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Verse 49, and those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this? who even forgives sins. Then he said to the woman, your faith has what? It has saved you. Go in peace. Many will view this passage as a favorite because of the beautiful display of God's grace, God's love toward a sinner. Consider the grace of God in this story. Yet, God's grace becomes more and more compelling when we look at some of the details here in Luke chapter 7. This particular Pharisee is given a name. What was his name? His name was given in verse 40, and Jesus calls him by his name. His name is Simon. So Simon the Pharisee, the woman does not have a name, but there is some identification that belongs to her. There are some clues as to who who she is that helps to describe her. Yes, she is nameless, but Scripture indicates that she was a sinner. Emphasis on the was. She was a sinner. She is bold. Bold in the sense that she invades the space of a respected figure such as a a Pharisee. So, a woman, a former sinner, bold, and now comes to show her devotion and worship Jesus. 
And she is weeping. And she is weeping at the feet of Jesus. She possesses an alabaster jar. Remember last week we described the alabaster jar as a soft stone. Some say it's a semi-translucent stone that's carved into a container to, to hold fragrant oils. She wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. And this woman, this former sinner, this forgiven woman, anoints Jesus. <laughs> this cannot be a common occurrence. Simon the Pharisee is appalled. Sinners like this woman would not be allowed to be around a holy man. If Jesus knew the manner of which this woman is, he would not let her anywhere near her. But yet, Jesus does let her come near. So Simon's internal dialogue kicks in. It kicks into a, a, a mode of criticizing. You know the internal dialogue that happens within us. We come across somebody who offends us or somebody who is doing something that we, we just love to criticize them or what they are doing. And this is what's happening to Simon the Pharisee. The criticizing voice starts talking. He's talking to himself. Verse 39 again. Now when the Pharisee who, who invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Simon cannot agree with the thought that Jesus is a prophet, much less the anticipated Savior. If Jesus were a prophet, he would know exactly who this woman is. Jesus would be able to know the thoughts of this woman. You see, in Older Testament times, prophets like Elisha and Elijah, they knew what was going on in the mind of the king. <laughs> and so for Simon, the Pharisee, Jesus cannot be a prophet because Jesus doesn't know who it is who's washing his feet. Well, that's what Simon thinks. To Simon, the woman at the feet of Jesus is a sinner. How does he know this? Perhaps the whole town knew that she was a sinner. And how does he let her into her house? You see, Simon's home is not terribly big, perhaps not big enough to host a number of people for, uh, for a meal. But homes at that time had courtyards big enough to host a number of people. So if you can imagine in the courthouse... A low table. Surrounded by that table are a number of guests who recline around this table. No chairs. The certain woman, when she hears that Jesus will be at Simon's, she invites herself into the courtyard. The reclining around the table is common, and as chairs were not a trend at the time, the table is not high, it's a low table. So one leans into the table, propping oneself up with one arm, and with the other arm in hand, takes, partakes of the food. Your feet, then, are somewhat stretched out away from the table. And this is how the woman has access to Jesus' feet. As Simon criticizes Jesus and the woman in his heart, Jesus speaks up wanting to say something to Simon. With Simon's permission, Jesus tells a parable. <laughs> Jesus' parable and teaching clearly shows that Jesus can read the heart of Simon. Perhaps Jesus really is a prophet. Perhaps Jesus is more than just a prophet. You see, Jesus can read your heart right now. Perhaps you harbor criticism toward another such that this parable is meant specifically for you today. 
in Jesus' parable, his story with a point, there is a creditor, a lender of money, one who loans out money, and two debtors or individuals who have taken those loans and now are unable to pay back those loans that they had borrowed. So, if you were the creditor, what would you do? You've lent out money. Maybe you've lent out money to a sibling, a family member, a child, a friend. Maybe you've lent out money before and you've come under the circumstance where they were not able to pay you back. What do you do if you're the creditor? Would you forgive them? (laughs) Would you forgive them? For the debtors, they owe amounts vastly different from each other. One owed 500 denarii. The other owed 50 denarii. Now, one denarii at that time is worth one day's worth of wage. So if you can imagine owing 500 days wages, that's a lot of money. That's that's more than maybe, what, a year and a half? worth of wages the other now has 50 that owes it's considerably smaller but not insignificant the smaller amount is almost two months worth of wages you think of all the money that's being handed out right now how can it ever be paid back creditor He forgives the debtors, both the 500 and the 50. They no longer owe anything. Let me ask you, if you're that debtor, is that good news? (laughs) It's really good news. Are you thankful for the forgiveness of your debt? Absolutely, you should be. So the question for Simon is also a question for you. Which of the debtors will love the forgiving creditor more? So which one is it? If you were the, uh, which one would love the forgiving creditor more? The 500 debtor or the 50 denarii debtor? Which one? It's going to be the 500 The one who owed more. So Simon's answer to Jesus, well, Jesus agrees with his right answer. The one forgiven more will love more. Forgiven much, love much. When grace, when forgiveness is given, How should it be received? Jesus then turns to the woman but continues to talk with Simon. Jesus points out that the customary function of the host was neglected at that time. The custom was that the servant would would be prepared with some water to wash the feet of the guests. So, Water and towels were not provided at this meal. And then there was supposed to be that customary kiss, that, uh, that greeting, that oriental greeting with a kiss to welcome the guests, but none was offered to Jesus. If there was one to be criticized, it should have been Simon the Pharisee who was the host. The woman, formerly a sinner, is not not taking for granted the immensity of the situation. Messiah is here. She has heard the teachings of Jesus, and she is convicted by those teachings. She has experienced forgiveness from Messiah. She is not going to let this opportunity pass her by. She has been forgiven much, and now she is going to love him much so she comes where their alabaster jar of fragrant oil and she lets her hair down 
And she's kneeling at the feet of Jesus. She's forgiven much. She loves much. The parable of Jesus cuts to the heart. The woman and Simon are the two debtors. Which one was a 500 denarii debtor? Apparently in this story, it was the woman. It is not that Simon sins less than the woman. It is that Simon has held back repenting of the majority of his sins. Therefore, he is not forgiven much because he doesn't ask for that forgiveness. The woman in her sinful state was aware of her sins and in humility and in her despair comes to Jesus for forgiveness, but not not Simon. Even though, if we, if we follow this parable, even though Simon does experience a little bit of forgiveness, even though Simon does experience a little bit of, of God's grace and love in his life, he still does not completely surrender to God with his sins. The woman shows much love, not in order to get forgiveness. The woman shows much love because she is forgiven. God's grace is powerful. When the grace of God is embraced, it transforms the human being. At the end of these 10 days of prayer, let us love much because we have been forgiven much. May the grace of God keep revival happening within our church. The forgiven much and love much theology is compelling when we consider the characters in today's message. There is debate over their identity. Without knowing their identity beyond what is presented here in Luke chapter 7, it is a wonderful teaching that Jesus forgives much because he loves much. It's a powerful lesson. It shows the great character of God. Yet I want you to consider the possibility, the possibility that the woman in the city who was a sinner in Luke chapter 7 is Mary. Just consider for a moment that the certain woman who was a sinner in Luke chapter 7 was Mary of Bethany. The same Mary that we talked about last Sabbath. From my humble point of view, the strongest connections between today's passage and last Sabbath's passages have to do with a few cues, clues, that really speaks deeply to me. The first clue that I want to bring to your attention that not only was mentioned in our passage today, but also in last week's passages, Matthew chapter 26, Mark 14, and John 12, is the alabaster box. I mean, how many times throughout Scripture is this alabaster box going to be mentioned? How many times in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is this alabaster box going to be mentioned? I think that's our clue to the identity of this certain woman in Luke chapter 7. Because that alabaster box is mentioned again in Matthew chapter 26 and Mark 14. Whereas last week we made the connection between Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John 12, whereas in John 12, the contents of the alabaster box was this fragrant oil, the spikenard oil. Clue number one, alabaster box. Clue number two, to the identity of this certain woman in Luke chapter 7, is that she is at Jesus' feet. 
how many times are you going to find a woman at the feet of Jesus in Scripture? This woman seems to be at the feet of Jesus quite often. That's clue number two. Clue number three, guess what she's doing at the feet of Jesus? She is washing the feet of Jesus. Now, I'm, I'm wondering what other cases in Scripture where we find that there is a woman with an alabaster box at the feet of Jesus, washing his feet, not just with her tears, but also with a fragrant oil and with her hair. Just consider for a moment that this, this certain woman in Luke chapter 7 is Mary of Bethany. Now, last Sabbath, we identified Mary of Bethany as also being the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Bethany is their hometown. It's uh, the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus is a, is a place where Jesus loves to hang out and, and rest. Mary of Bethany. And so for further intrigue, the house that the story takes place here in Luke chapter 7, we consider the house to be Simon the Pharisee, but consider this, who could also be Simon the leper, whose house is also located in Bethany, also the hometown of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We find that in, in John chapter 11, that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus live in Bethany. But we also find that Simon the leper lives in Bethany in Luke chapter uh, Luke chapter 26, Mark chapter 14, as well as in John chapter 12. So even though Luke chapter 7 identifies this Pharisee as Simon, in Matthew, Mark, Mark's, Matthew and Mark's account, this Simon is a leper. A leper who was healed by Jesus. If through these passages we make the link that Mary of Bethany is the forgiven woman in Luke chapter 7, then Mary of Bethany is not as innocent as some would believe. She was a sinner who was forgiven much, therefore loves much. This forgiven woman was transformed into a loving much woman at the feet of Jesus. The transformation of Mary into a deeply devoted disciple of Jesus lends itself to the possibility that Mary of Bethany, get this, could very well also be Mary of Magdalene. Magdalene at the time of the city of Magdalene at the time of Jesus' earthly ministry was known to be a town of prostitution. For a Pharisee to claim a woman is a sinner has strong evidence that that woman is probably a prostitute, selling herself for immoral acts. Mary of Magdalene in Luke chapter 8 is known to have had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus. Add to this that the woman caught in adultery, John chapter 8, could very well be the same woman. So all of these pieces of Scripture that surround a woman, what I'm proposing to you is that woman is the same woman. Mary of Bethany, Mary of Magdalene. A certain woman who is deeply devoted to Jesus. Because Jesus has healed her. Because Jesus has forgiven her. She's forgiven much. Therefore, she, she loves much. I liken all of these puzzles of 
Scripture to be like a puzzle. How many of you have ever worked on a puzzle? Maybe the pandemic has, has caused you to, to find a thousand-piece puzzle. <laughs> and maybe you're still working on it. I don't know. I know of former members who, uh, every time I would go visit them in their home, they had an, another puzzle that they were constantly working on. Constantly working on. But putting together the puzzles by shape only is a very interesting way of putting together a puzzle. I don't know if you've ever done this. Where you've taken the pieces of the puzzle, instead of looking on the, the design or the print, you turn it over. And have you, have you ever done this? Where you, where you try to put the puzzle together just by the shapes by the shape themselves. No, you're shaking your head. Why would I do that? <laughs> uh, maybe I'm a little bit odd, but I've, I've done that on several occasions where instead of looking at the design or the picture, you flip it over and you try to put the puzzle together just purely by the shape. Now, when you try this, it, invariably you'll come across some pieces that actually could fit or, or two pieces that could actually fit into one, but you're just not sure. When you flip it over and look at the design on the other side, then you have the clue, oh, this one does fit, the other one doesn't. I liken this journey that we've been on with, uh, with a certain woman in Mary of Bethany, Mary of Magdalene, as putting together pieces of a puzzle together. They could fit. They could fit. This woman, this certain woman, could very well be Mary of Bethany, Mary of Magdalene. Could be the woman who was caught in adultery in John chapter 8. By the way, that woman caught in adultery, you know where she was thrown into? She was thrown at the, the feet of Jesus. And was she forgiven? <laughs> she was forgiven. And what did Jesus say to her after she was forgiven? Go and sin no more. Go in peace. Go in peace. How God's love is incredibly transforming is something to, to experience for yourself. And so when you take those the pieces of the puzzle and you try to put it all together and you flip over that, that puzzle and you see the bigger picture, it is a glorious picture. Now each puzzle has its own merit. Each piece of, of Scripture can stand on its own merit and has great teaching for your life, transformation in your life. But when you put them all together and see the bigger picture, it is incredibly transforming. I invite you, if you have the book entitled The Desire of Ages, if you have the book The Desire of Ages, to read the chapter entitled The Feast at Simon's House. I want to read a passage here in in that same chapter at the very end it's page 568 let me share this passage with you when to human eyes her case appears hopeless christ saw in mary capabilities for good he saw the better traits of her character the plan of redemption has invested humanity with great possibilities, and in Mary, these possibilities are to be realized. Through His grace, she becomes a partaker of divine nature. The one who had fallen and whose mind had been a habitation of demons was brought very near to the Savior in fellowship and ministry. It was Mary who sat at his feet and learned of him. It was Mary who poured upon his head the precious anointing oil and bathed his feet with her tears. Mary stood beside the cross 
followed him to the sepulcher. Mary was first at the tomb after his resurrection. It was Mary who first proclaimed a risen Savior. When you put all of the pieces of the puzzle together, there is this fantastic transformation, a fantastic gospel transformation in the life of one individual, a woman, who was forgiven much and now loves much. Whether you are willing to follow my line of reasoning with Mary or not, should not, does not change God's love, His grace, His forgiveness. I'm wondering, church family, are you willing to experience His love, His grace, His forgiveness? I think what can fuel our revival in Jesus is His forgiveness. His forgiveness for me, His forgiveness for you, His forgiveness for the other. So church family, wherever you are, wherever you are worshiping with us, YouTube channel, our YouTube channel, or Facebook Live, if you would, in the chat, Respond. Respond to Jesus' offer of forgiveness, His transforming grace and love, His forgiveness. Just type in the chat there. Write in the comment. I want to experience God's forgiveness in my life. If that is you today, if you want to be transformed like this certain woman, if you want to be changed into not just a devoted follower of Christ, but one who passionately proclaims the love of Jesus like Mary. In the chat at this very moment, type in there, I want to experience God's forgiveness in my life. You know, throughout the pandemic, you may have caught yourself in experiencing a lot of anger, a lot of fear. Throughout the pandemic, there were other layers of, of issues in our world, in our country. Riots. Injustice. Accusations flowing back and forth. Just a lot of hatred flowing in and out of the rhetoric across our nation. And you may have caught yourself in a lot of anger, feeling a lot of anger. You may have caught yourself with a lot of fear, a lot of darkness. And maybe you have not truly trusted in the Lord. You've participated in in angry words and actions. You've, You've fallen and You've fallen into the temptation of fearing, fearing whatever it is that you're fearful of. You're not putting your trust in the Lord. You have put your trust in maybe imperfect people or even trusted in yourself. Throughout COVID, you have found yourself misrepresenting Jesus. Perhaps now is the time to seek forgiveness, to repent. Whatever whatever sin that you are messing around with, whatever sin that you find yourself in, addicted to, captive by, bring that sin to the feet of Jesus. Repent. Ask for His forgiveness. Worship Jesus at his feet. May Downers Grove, Seventh day Adventist Church family, be a people who is forgiven much and loves much. Let us pray. Lord, what an incredible God you are. That when we come to you, you're willing to welcome us 
When we come to your feet, we are humbled, we are broken, we are empty. We seek forgiveness, Lord. We are repenting. We show us how to worship you. Lord, thank you for this promise of forgiveness. Through the story of this certain woman in Luke chapter 7, you offer great forgiveness. We want to be a people forgiven much that we can be a people who loves you much. Thank you for doing that transformation in each of our lives, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We pray all of these things in the precious and most powerful name, Jesus Christ. Amen.